Alright guys, Simon here, we're playing Socrates Jones Prose Philosopher. Um Uh Okay, let's just get into it. <laughs> Can't think of anything to say. Um Socrates? Uh yes. Yes, Arbiter? I have been pondering your request that I bring forth my best. It seems to me that attempting to assign a quality hierarchy to the philosophers in this realm would be demeaning. Yeah, hmm. I have thus determined that when you request my best, I mean my most challenging. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> so on that note, allow me to present you Immanuel Kant. His thoughts are indeed quite challenging. I don't know, his books are quite challenging. I think he's mostly... I don't know. I'm actually not... I'm personally not very impressed by Immanuel Kant, to be honest. Um, anyway. Should we look it up? I don't know if this is um, useful to look him up. K A N T. Come on, come on. Uh, he's German. Couldn't have Socrates Jones. So that's him. Um, 1724 to 1804, a German philosopher who is widely considered to be a central figure of modern philosophy. Yeah. Well, actually, well, okay, I mean that... Hmm. He argued that human concepts and categories structure our view of the world and its laws, and that reason is the source of morality. His thought continues to hold a major influence in contemporary thought, especially in fields such as metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, political philosophy, and aesthetics. Uh, Kant's major work, The Critique of Pure Reason, aims to bring reason together with experience and to move beyond what he took, took to be failures of traditional philosophy and metaphysics. He hoped to end an age of speculation where objects outside experiments were seen to support what he saw as futile theories while resisting the skepticism of thinkers such as David Hume. Okay, I mean, in, in the context of his time, and then, then I'm very impressed by what he what he um proposed but given you know the kind of developments that we've made since his time i'm not that impressed <laughs> does that make sense anyway as it says here he, he was a what, what does he say a central figure of modern philosophy yeah he was one of the um major figures early on to um you know to 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 put reason and um, and I guess evidence as as you know central to physics rather than although I don't know okay let's just play the game and see how we go with with this because I, I feel like he makes some of the same mistakes that the people he's criticizing does like he um, he he makes certain assumptions or he just kind of defines certain words and, and ideas and then goes from there rather than seeing you know rather than than looking at evidence as much as I would like. I feel like can't argue that experience is purely subjective without first being processed by pure reason. No, but even reason is subjective. Or rather you know there's no such thing as pure reason because cause our our minds are not you know, human brains work on emotion more so than, than logic. Like pure reason is is not a you know that the human mind can't actually do pure reason we can we can approximate it, but you know we're always um you know we we, we can't get out of emotions and instincts as well, so you know when he talks about pure reason. He also said that using reason without applying to experience only leads to theoretical illusions. Yeah. But your experience is purely subjective. <laughs> but do you see what I mean? I feel like it's... anyway. You probably don't see what I mean, to be honest. Alright, let's just go through this. Good talk, Socrates really Jones. Oh god, good luck with this one. I could only ever get through the first couple pages of his work. I hope you enjoyed your stay in philosopho philosophical kindergarten. For the conflicting methods you have employed to confuse other philosophers would not work here. 
I... Uh, why not? No reason, I simply needed to fulfill the prerequisite grandstanding. Grandstanding check. Alright, good job, bro. Okay. Count, if you would please explain your philosophy as clearly as possible. Of course, Arbiter. First, I must counter the unreasoned thoughts of other philosophers. Any truly moral philosophy must first and foremost protect human dignity. See that? Why? Why, why does it need to protect human dignity? And whose dignity are you protecting? Like, you know, you, you, you bring dignity into morality, but then you're just kind of defining a new word and, and saying it's the, it's the equivalent of morality. And that's it. I mean, what, what is dignity? What, what is dignity? It's an emotion. It's just something you feel. And, uh, f so, I don't know. So how how what where's the what's what's the reasoning what's what's the reason how do what does dignity have to do with pure reason and logic right right like there's no dignity is is a is a feeling it's not logical anyway as consequentialist thought naturally violates our pride and pride we must work from an intentional grounding no but what is what is pride why is pride important. Is, is pride equivalent to morality? I've seen pride make people do immoral things. You know? So I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think this is very, uh, philosophical. Excuse me? <laughs> I'm already confused. I, I'm not. He's just making things up. Give me a moment here, Jones, and I shall explain. There are many things which men covered as good. Sure. However, a focus on consequences reduces men to mere means, undermining human dignity. A focus on consequences reduces men to mere means, undermining human dignity. But what's wrong with undermining human dignity? Is dignity more, more important than, say, being alive? Like, is dignity more important than keeping your family alive? Like, why? I mean, if you, if you have to murder a million people to retain your dignity, is that moral? I don't... I don't, I don't understand why dignity is important. Yeah. Anyway. In reality, the only thing that is good without qualification is goodwill. Why? See, he's just defining that. He's not explaining that. Like, if, if goodwill leads to bad outcomes, how is that good? Why, why, why would that be good? Thus, we are moral if our will is defined by the intention of doing the moral thing. But, but intent is, is not reliable, because everybody thinks differently. Some people are genuinely crazy, and other people are, shall we say, not as informed as they should be. Okay, they're stupid. <laughs> some people are, are crazy, some people are stupid. And so, I mean, they, they have in, the intention of doing the moral thing, but then they, they make mistakes. I mean, we all make mistakes, but, you know, crazy people make more mistakes than others, maybe. But, so if we intend to do the right thing, we make mistakes, we kill a lot of people. How's that? Is that still moral? Is that still moral? Or so should we... I, I don't know. I mean... Uh, an intelligent person, if we if we kind of allow such you know qualifications, if if an intelligent person intends to do the right thing, and and is careful about what he does and saves a lot of people's lives, okay, that's moral. But if a a careless person carelessly intends to do the right thing but doesn't take the necessary precautions and gets a lot of people hurt, and according to to this he would still be moral. Even though his outcomes were not what he intended. That seems to, you know, grant a lot of license to people who are not careful, or who are not... You, know, you, know, you see what I mean? It seems really dangerous. And there we go. That's it. As you can see, I'm approaching this from a different angle than the neophytes you debated before. No, you, you're pretty much still just making things up and then saying they're equivalent to, to morality without actually proving it. The intentionalism added to the idea slate. 
so wait, the consequences of action don't matter at all. At the very least, they are irrelevant to moral worth. That's... I can't... I can't support that. I don't... I don't... I don't see how... that can work. Of course, ideally, one's actions would also have positive consequences, but it is positive intentions that are essential to be of moral character. Moral character. But if you make mistakes all the time, and your good intentions result in bad cons bad outcomes all the time, then you need to stop being moral, <laughs> or stop trying to be moral, because you're doing it wrong. <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, a lot of people think they're doing the right things. I mean, even even people who do bad things often think they're doing the right thing, but that's not good enough. You know, we still put them in prison. If they if they make a mistake, as it were. Socrates, are you ready to continue? All right, here goes. So far, this doesn't seem too bad. Yes, Abita. Yeah, let us let us begin then. There are many things which men covet as good. Question relevance. How is this related to your conclusion? I am acknowledging the diversity and breadth of moral theory. Okay. It seems only fitting to recognize the scope of the field we enter, does it not? Sure. However, we focus on consequences reduces men to mere means, undermining human dignity. There's so many things you need to explain there. Can you clarify this for me? I mean they're getting caught up in various ends, whether they be happiness, a social contract, or piety, causes one to lose sight of what is most important. They turn our beings into mere tools for an arbitrary goal. Why is dignity important? I'm pretty sure dignity and morality are different things. Cogs in the careless and soulless machine. Yeah, well, soulless machines can do a lot of good in the world, depending on how they're built. Um, personal backing. What do you have to support the statement? I believe you've actually discovered this yourself, Socrates Jones. Take, for example, what John Stuart Mill and his philosophy of utilitarianism. By arbitrarily assigning the status of ultimate end to happiness, the philosophy completely ignores human rights and dignity. But by arbitrarily assigning the status of ultimate end to dignity, you ignore consequences. <laughs> You, know, you, you see the problem here? You see the problem here? In Hobbes' idea that good rest and security, any rational person would question how much we must sacrifice to enforce such an ideal. So how much should we sacrifice for our dignity? Can't. No, all these philosophers are looking at the wrong places. They're claiming the contingent and ephemeral as eternal without any justification. Mankind must not be reduced to the means of some other goal. Any philosophy that does so has become mired in consequentialism. No, but but humans are temporary and ephemeral. Why should why would our why would human goals be permanent if humans are not permanent? What? Uh, question relevance. How is this related to conclusion? It deals with many of the ideas of previous philosophers in one swoop, showing their philosophies to be full of irrationalities. Bro, you're doing the exact same thing. Just think, if your thoughts were as organized as I, you would have gotten it here much sooner. No. Undermining human dignity. Intention is, according to Kant, all true moral systems are intention based. Alright. In reality, the only thing that is good without qualification is goodwill. Ask for clarification. Why? What do you mean by this? Goodwill is always good. There's no situation in which harboring goodwill could be immoral. Um. No, that's not true. That's not true. Can you back that up? Can you back this up? As a man cannot possibly know the consequences of his actions, it is only fit to judge the will upon which he acts. When this will is good, there can be no doubt that, regardless of the effect, his actions were moral in nature. No, but that, believing that, is immoral. Believing that is immoral, because we know 
he just said that we know men can't know the consequences of their actions. Like if if somebody thinks he's doing good, and you see that person making a mistake, it isn't isn't it moral for you to stop him? So isn't it isn't it moral for you to challenge his actions, if even if he believes they're right, but you can see that they're wrong, it, it's it's moral for you to challenge him and stop him, and therefore you can't support his morality that way. I mean, if you if you say that he is being moral, but nevertheless, to it is moral for you to stop him. It is moral for you to stop him from doing what he thinks is moral from his perspective. So it's not it's not useful. It's not useful as a value system then because. Even if you concede that what he's doing is moral, it, you are still, you know, it is still moral for you to get in his way. So it, it does, it's not useful as a value judgment. It's not like you can say, okay, that's moral. We should let him do it. No, it, you're saying that okay, that that's moral for you, but we we still have to stop you from doing it. Do you see what I mean? Like it's not useful, and it's not like you can say, okay, this is right, this is wrong. We should, we should do the right thing. We should do the we should not do the wrong thing because you're saying that. You know, even if he's wrong, he has good intentions. Therefore, he's right. But even if he's right, I still have to stop him because it'll be wrong if I don't stop him. See how that ends up contradicting itself, and it's kind of useless as a as a value judgment. Then assigning the assessing the will is the only way to keep man as an end and maintain his dignity. Why is dignity important? It's not. It's just something that that you like. So what you're saying is, when I tell Ari she can't go to a party because I'm concerned for her, my action is noble regardless of a response. <laughs> this is correct. But if Ari thinks that going to the party is correct, then she should go no matter what you think, because that's also correct. That is really the only good. <laughs> Without qualification, is goodwill. Question relevance. How is this related to your conclusion? This is my conclusion here, Jones. Most of the good laid out are invalid. Only this one stands in all situations. Thus, we are moral if our will is defined by the intention of doing the moral thing. Clarification? What do you mean by this? As long as we intend to act morally, then we ourselves are moral. No, no we're not. This seems pretty straightforward, does it not here, Jones? No, it's not straightforward. But uh, how do we know whether the intention, intended course of action is moral? By whether or not it adheres to the categorical imperatives, of course. See, now he's making up more things. Of uh, course. Oh, no, wait, hold on. <laughs> what? <laughs> Can't these things you just mentioned? Categorical imperatives? Yes, uh, what are they exactly? Indeed, I don't believe you have explained those. My apologies. Categorical imperatives are the moral laws we should seek to discover. You're assuming that there are laws. You're assuming that there are rules that work in all situations when in fact there aren't. I mean, I've said this before, every rule has an exception. Rules are useful tools, but they're never absolute. Or they, they don't work if you try to make them absolute. Anyway, listen closely, I should explain. Alright, come on, bring it up. If we intend to always do the moral thing, we must develop rules or maxims to shape our actions. No! No, it doesn't work anymore. This guy... Like, his ideas and his conclusions, I don't think are very useful. I think his methods, his philosophical methods, I think, are useful. But, but he makes a lot of the same mistakes as the other people. I don't know. There are certain actions which must always be, we must, all, we must always avoid, but there aren't. Other actions we should take at every opportunity. These ideas form rules that we must follow at all times, regardless of emotion or consequence. These rules are categorical imperatives. Okay, the confusion people feel about this man's ideas makes sense now. No, no, it's not. Alright, dollar dot. Where should I begin? Dot dot dot. Dot 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 dot. There's eight dots. Um, can't. <laughs> exclamation! Exclamation! Ah, apologies, Head Jones. I was momentarily distracted by your beard. 
It is quite nice, isn't it? There's five lines in that beard. It is unsightly. <laughs> How can one stand to have such a blemish on one's face? Hey, the coat is one of the few cool things about my dad. That's very cool. He needs a ponytail too. <laughs>